So welcome to our tasting of three Merlots, uh, and thanks for, for having us here. Uh, we don't want our presentation to come between those three Merlots uh, and, and your mouths and your palates. So, so please start drinking right now. While, while we're talking, start drinking, right? And, and you'll notice there's some treats on the table. And they're not really there because they're any sort of match with the, uh, with the wine, but you'll notice that a lot of the notes in wines, uh, people will talk about, people will talk about in, in uh, uh, wine criticism. And uh, I notice that sometimes people don't exactly know what those notes are. They're not familiar with them, especially in the United States, black currant, for example, uh, every European uh, seems to know black currant. Uh, when I give them the nose of black currant, oh, you know, I got in trouble for kicking a football into my mom's black currant bush, but we don't have those associations when we smell black currant. So in front of you, you have some uh, jam, some confiture. Uh, one, the clear one, is of violet leaves, violet flowers, which is a common note in wine through the wine production. Uh, there's something called uh, uh, alpha and beta ionone, and that produces combined the, the note of violets, and you'll, you'll find them in Merlot. As a matter of fact, these Merlots. You'll also find, um, uh, you'll also find damson plums. Uh, what else do we have there? Black currant, raspberry, and am I missing one? MC. Morello cherry. That's Morello cherry jam. So go ahead, put them on a cracker. I think their service were there and prime yourself to be familiar with some of the notes that you may get in, uh, in the Merlots we're having. For that matter, your pencil is made of cedar, and so often when people talk about graphite, they, they really mean, graphite doesn't have a smell, but they mean the cedar. When you shave off some cedar in your pencil, it releases a whole bunch of aromatic chemicals. They're called sesquiterpenes and they smell really profoundly like cedar. That mixed with some tobacco, you have some uh, cigar box. Uh, I think everyone has access to some leather. Everyone's wearing leather shoes. Uh, so if you really need the leather, if you don't remember that, you can go for that. Uh, but, but I think all around you, you now have access to familiar flavors. And so go ahead and tuck in. So we want to uh, talk first about some of the wines, and we'll start with François Michaville, who will talk about the expression of Merlot in Côte de Bourg, as well as uh, Roque de Combe specifically, that property in Côte de Bourg. We have Monsieur Bruyard right here, who's gonna talk a little bit about his Cuvée, uh, Cuvée Oscar, and, and why it's called Cuvée Oscar. That's the le plus. Uh, and then we'll also leave some time for a parlement. So we'd like to, after we taste, have you guys think about the wines and what you smell. You have all this equipment in front of you, including the equipment of your, your uh, uh, gustatory apparatus. Take some notes down on your, on your tasting sheet. And then maybe we can talk about this as a parlement. While you guys are thinking, we can circulate and uh, ask any, answer any questions. So uh, first, we'll, we'll have uh, some thoughts from, um, uh, from uh, uh, François uh, Michaville and then uh, Hubert Brouillard, if that's OK. Merlot is more different because it needs, a, it needs a warm exposure because it's an opulent variety. Uh, yes. So it needs a, a Mediterranean type of exposure. But at the same time, it needs a cold, humid soil to run the lane, you know? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, and so, so that, that explains that for wines of maceration, it's not so easy going to find Merlot everywhere because if the soil is a bit too much warm, it is hard because the variety can give fruit that are a little bit cooked, a little bit flabby, a little bit common, you know? Yes. And, uh, yes. Uh, that in very humid soils in Bordeaux, is actually very strange that the vegetation cycle goes slowly because it has humidity and the stays cold. And you harvest our Merlot in the same day as the harvest the Cabernet Sauvignon in Aubryon, in the dry gravel of Aubryon. So it's adapted. Now, just to talk a, a little bit about Merlot and Côte de Bourg and Roque de Cambe. 
mainly Merlot in, in Bordeaux is in the humid, uh, cold, clay soil due to the, the, the conditions that make the best expression of the fruit of this variety. But you have the slopes of Saint Lyon, the southern slopes, where you have the, this, this uh, Mediterranean sub microclimate and these cold soils that ripe and play that have these qualities of being opulent, fresh, and elegant at the same time. Cote de Bourg is very different because you have suddenly, it's the only soil in Bordeaux where you have slopes in front of the south of clay on limestone falling directly over the estuary of Gironde, which is the widest estuary of Europe. So it's, it's very different. In French, you have the gravel of uh, Marbeau, uh, uh, saint Esther, what, whatever you want, uh, of the Médoc, uh, um, um, Pouillac. And in French, you have opposite soil. You have cold clay on humid limestones in my, it's a Mediterranean climate falling directly over this estuary, which is extremely wide. So you are more in a temperate Atlantic type of weather. In the winter, it's a little bit more warm. Uh, let's two degrees, quite, two, three degrees, quite important. In the terrible frost of uh, 1991, uh, Rock de Camp did not frost at all. And um, um, in the summer, might be two degrees less. So it temperates, the vegetation, vegetation cycle is very slow and regular, the vine doesn't suffer, you know. And you have a specific expression that doesn't exist anywhere in Bordeaux of the slopes, southern slopes of clay and limestone with Merlot because it's a little bit more, you could say, the hot shocks are not so violent that interior climates of saint emilion or eventually also type of soil called the Castillon as well. So you are in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where the wine is a little bit more, a little bit more red, red black fruit that black coffee, you know? I see. The are strong, and you are somewhat a little bit more muscular and spectacular, you know, it's more, more, more dynamic. I, don't, I do not mean at all it's better. I just try to, to, to understand the character of uh, yes. the Merlot in Cote d'Ivoire. This is rather subtle because, you know, depending on the year, uh, rain, sun, rain, it changes. And you cannot say that a, a terroir has a mechanical uh, relation with the flavor. You cannot yes. say that is the taste of Pomerol, that is the taste of, of, uh, of saint Estelle, because the year is different every year. So yes. rain changes the game. And as you said a few minutes ago, human beings are extremely important and change and play with the game in a different manner too, you know. But if you could say on a very general mood, you have this expression of wines that are uh, 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 round, they are uh, quite uh, very supple because Merlot is a supple variety, but they are more muscular than you would have in, in Saint-Emilion or Côte de Castillon, you know, they are more, yes. uh, uh, they have more peps, you could say. It, it, some, someone can say they are more, you could say, uh, more structured if they want to criticize. Other would say they are, they are more uh, uh, dynamic. Uh, uh, someone who wants to, to prefer, you know, because unfortunately, you have a monk taster, moralist of the taste, you know. You see, you have yes. a lot of people who say that on a moralistic point of view is a good taste, that on a moralistic point of view is a bad taste. And these tasters, they pass by understanding the, uh, the pleasure of the variety of the flavors when the wines are good. So other tasters could say, let's, it's a million, it's a little bit more decadent, a little bit more voluptuous, but more evolved, more confused, too much. Well, that doesn't mean anything. This slight difference of character are fascinating, you know. And that is a question of uh, the Côte de Bourg in front of other situations. So, uh, before we go on, and Hubert, would you mind uh, sp saying a few notes about the expression of, of Merlot in La Lande de Pomerol? Uh, but before, uh, before you do that, I just want to say that I had three questions for Francois Michaville, uh, and, uh, and then kind of a, uh, not a question, but some thoughts. Uh, what would you like to uh, say to Hubert, since uh, he can't be here? And I budgeted, we both budgeted about a half an hour for the, you know, three questions and saying something to, uh, uh, to Hubert. And it was uh, almost an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, so this is a condensing. 
uh, 15 minutes was expressing his great affection for Hubert de Bouillard uh, as a fellow artist. Uh, but this guy is a poet, philosopher, artist, in addition to a winemaker. The topics uh, ranged from the moral particularism to the Kantian view of the world as applied to, uh, as applied to wines. Uh, so uh, truly a polymath and, and brings everything into his wines. Uh, his other vineyard is Tertre Rotbeuf. And, and I'll be bringing a bottle of that, the 2011, for tonight's dinner, uh, if you want a taste of his, of his other property. Uh, so before I go on to the actual wines, I'd love to hear, uh, we'd love to hear, Hubert, about the expression of Merlot in uh, specific uh, to La Lande de Pomerol. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much to François Michelville. He's very good. Uh, he's a very nice guy. Well, thank you very much, um, and also thank you very much to Francois Mijavi, very good friend. And I think uh, what they have done in uh, Saint Emilion with the uh, Théâtre de Boeuf and in the Rôle de Camp is just amazing, and uh, especially what he talked about the Merlot. But the poet, I think uh, they are very close to the literature and what is also more uh, the spirit of the wine. It's very interesting. Um, just a few words about the, the Merlot. We talk about that, but uh, for the Merlot, I think uh, no doubt that uh, for the Merlot we need clay or limestone, uh, or clay and limestone. Uh, and uh, if it's possible, uh, the expression of the Merlot is the most important when it's a little bit cold in the subsoil. Uh, the surface is not so important as you can see what's happened when we talk about Petrus or, or Strota Noir. I think you, you taste this wine. You have the clay and on the surface you have big gravel stone that uh, it's not uh, bad to have something like uh, stone on the surface because it's re-give the, 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 the temperature during, during the night and it's a good moderation. But the subsoil is very important to have deep um, clay or limestone, and the clay is really, for me, better. It's the place where, where, where the roots can provide the, 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 the elements and make the, the wine more fresh and the complexity of the Merlot. He, he explained very well, the Merlot must be very common, or good, or very good, but not very often very, very good or great. Uh, and we need really this kind of soil. And in, in, in La Lande de Pomerol, um, we selected a piece of land uh, where we have seven hectares, which is on really on the surface. You could be maybe uh, in Chateauneuf du Pas because you have big gravel stone like that. It's just amazing. But just 30 centimeters to more than 1.3 meters, you have clay. And you have blue clay. And the blue clay is cold, you know, because the blue clay is no oxidation of the clay. Uh, Sometimes you have uh, brown or red clay, means that it's oxidation, it means that uh, you have air or maybe something. Blue, it means that it's very um, uh, reduction place where you have just called an expression of a, um, of a style of the Merlot. We have seven hectares on sort of small hill like that. And when we bought Fleur de Bois, we, we selected the seven hectares. In the seven hectares, mixed, we have very old vines. And we have just selected the very old vines in the seven hectares. And just a word, because it's QV Oscar, because it's yeah. my grandson one of my grandson, and we have um, uh, six different cuvées now, because I have six, uh, six grandchildren, and uh, we have one Gaspar, one Oscar, one Simon, one Diane, one, uh, well, well, this is uh, every year, the, the fortunately, we have uh, always, uh, we have no, we, have, we never had two, uh, uh, two grandson or granddaughter in the same year, that's, uh, Thank you. No, thank, pleasure. Thank, thank you. Um, 
So I, the, the Cuvée Oscar was particularly interesting because I've heard Cuvée Oscar, Cuvée Gaspar, all these names. So there's a special name for the special wine made from the special vines, but every year has an additional special name. And so uh, just a couple of days ago, you told me why. So uh, thanks. Now, uh, we have these three wines. This whole uh, session uh, has been nothing but Merlot, 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 Merlot. And so uh, this... Uh, this name for the presentation of three Merlots is perhaps too unassuming. Why these three Merlots when all we've been having is Merlot-based wines? It's because these are three what I consider very unusual Merlots that are also appropriate for compare and contrast in two wonderful recent years, the 2015 and the 2016. I think the received wisdom is that the two Merlot territories in Bordeaux are Pomerol and Saint-Amillon. And so we have clay, gravel, limestone. And that's it. And Saint-Amillon, there's limestone, and then there's a bunch of clay and gravel in Pomerol with some silt-sand mixture in different parts of Pomerol. And that's kind of the extent of most people's, even Bordeaux lovers' <coughs> knowledge of the right bank. And so what we sought to do here is say, you know what, there's actually a lot more. There's Lalande de Pomerol, and we're going to have a brilliant wine from Lalande, the Cuvée Oscar, from Lalande de Pomerol. Why not Lalande de Pomerol if it's so similar to Pomerol in terms of its gravel and clay soil? Uh, Cote de Bourg, and we heard a lot about Cote de Bourg and where it is, and the limestone there. Well, why not there if the terroir is in many ways similar to some of the slopes on the saint Amion Plateau. In fact, it is a, a, a deep extension northward of the saint Amion Plateau. Uh, uh, Hubert had said, Fronsac, it's the same plateau, and Castillon, it's the same plateau. That's the same plateau that goes all the way north, and there's a fault line that brings that plateau up. So this guy, at a time when it was unfashionable to grow, uh, well, any fine wine, in Cote de Bourg, which is the Bourg area is known for, you know, the reputation is selling single, single digit Euro wines in the truck stop. And here we have this, you know, amazing wine. And, uh, you know, it takes creativity, artist, art, art, artistry, and innovation, and a lot of courage to do that. And that's what Francois Mitjaville did. And then for uh, uh, La Dominique, like Figeac, that is on the unusual gravel portion of the Saint-Amillon uh, Saint pla um, uh, Plateau. And it's the, almost the, the part where Pomerol kind of leaks over the boundary, because the boundary is man-made, but the geological boundary would encompass uh, parts of La Dominique and Figeac and, and uh, Cheval Blanc. So that's why we're having these three wines, and, and this is where they are. So Roque de Combe is really far north, just across uh, the river from from uh, Margot, and then La Lande de Pomerol is in uh, the Le Plus, is from La Lande de Pomerol, and then La Dominique is from the Grave part of Saint Amillon. So, Miles is going to start the program for us here. Miles? Just here we try go. To be your normal humor self, okay? The guy you were before the tailspin. Do you remember that guy? People love that guy. Don't forget, your novel is coming out in the fall. Oh, really? How exciting. What's it called? Come here, Miles. Come here. Do not sabotage me. If you want to be a Whoa. fucking lightweight, then that's your call. But do not sabotage me. Oh, aye, aye, Captain. You got it. And if they want to drink Merlot, we're drinking Merlot. No, if anybody orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I am not drinking any fucking Merlot! So at the end of the movie, Miles consoles himself with his, with his prized wine. <laughs> that wine was the 1961 Cheval Blanc, which is about half Merlot. So apparently wine did have, uh, Miles did have some gaps in his knowledge, right? In fact, the odds are, are really high for 
any wine in Bordeaux except for the, uh, the Grand Cru uh, Classé of the Médoc region and, and, and uh, Aubryon to be mostly Merlot. 66, two-thirds of, of the red grapes in, in Bordeaux are Merlot. And 57% in, in the Grave, almost half in Médoc. And then, of course, 72% up and down the right bank. And these are the three wines, the Roque de Combe from 2016, and then from 2015, La, Dom La Dominique and then the Cuvée Oscar. I'm going to let you read about these wines a little bit. You might see a lot of these notes being represented by what's in front of you. The violet uh, for cedar, smell your pencil, seriously. Uh, or even take your fingernail and etch your pencil and smell it, that's cedar. And then you'll have all the fruits there. The graphite doesn't have any smell again. And then I want you to think about these things. As you taste the wines, you, you are now familiar with some of these notes in the wines. So where are you getting them? Look at the wine. You know, you've got a white tasting sheet. Uh, is it on the nose? Is it the mid palate? Is it in the back, the retronasal? Is it on the very end, the finish? How long is the finish? Start writing these things down. I'd love you guys to be prepared for, for a, a, a rich parlement. <coughs> what I do sometimes is I actually time the length of the finishes too. And here's the common theme with these wines. Now, Merlot comes from Merlot, which is the local Occitan um, dialect for the blackbird. And the, the fondness for the Merlot grape uh, led to the grape taking on the name of the bird. So that's where Merlot comes from. So where does Merlot come from in terms of parentage? Well, Merlot, Merlot's mom was uh, Magdalene Noir de Charente. And, uh, and, and I think we've known Ma Merlot's uh, father is Cabernet, Cabernet Franc. Uh, the, the mother was kind of a surprise. It was just 15 years ago or so that we, uh, that we found uh, like four vines in a stranded vineyard somewhere in Brittany, and then later in Charente we uh, found a bunch more of these isolated vines. And, and uh, the name was referred to as Madeline, uh, Madeleine, and that's a commonly given name for the, for the grapes that ripen before the feast day of Mary Magdalene. Uh, which is July 22nd. So this is really early. Early ripening uh, grapes have that name, uh, 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 Madeleine, uh, Magdalene. So the grape was thought extinct until 2004. And Merlot's mom, uh, Merlot's grandmom, is Ondaribi Beltza. Uh, Beltza is Basque for black. And Ondaribi comes from Ondaribia, which is a, a town just across the Spanish border. And so it's the black grape of that Basque town. It's about five days by horse. Uh, but I, I think uh, uh, I was being, I, this is all I knew. It was across the border, five days by horse. That's not what Google said, but I threw that in there. Uh, and and uh, you know, there was this rumor that somewhere down south was the lineage of Merlot, but no one really knew exactly how it got there. Testing. Exactly, exactly. Carol Meredith and, and all that jazz. That's exactly right. So they, they, knew the de they knew the father, they didn't know the mother. And then they found this isolated vine and they got the mother. But um, uh, Hubert, you were telling me that it's a little bit more complicated where this comes from, correct? Uh, the Mediterranean and actually not along this coast, but from the Mediterranean, right? Yes. So just, uh, I think that everybody knows that uh, the story start in Georgia or Armenia or somewhere, then in the Mediterranean, as the sea that uh, the Finnish uh, push, and uh, you had uh, everywhere in Mediterranean, the Lebanon, the Turkish, everywhere, and then part of the grape of it is arriving in Marseille or, 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 or in Mediterranean. And part uh, uh, goes through Gibraltar and arrive along the Portugal and then Spain and they arrived, in fact, uh, also at this period, long time ago, and Pibas Bordeaux. So it wasn't the A63? 
<laughs> okay, okay, all right. Uh, so far more circu circuitous. Uh, and, and so we've actually got a, a couple, uh, a few bottles of this uh, Ondaribi Belza uh, around here. If anyone wants a taste, uh, I don't know if it's around here right now. If, it, if it's not during one of the presentations, I'll, I'll go grab uh, some of the bottles and, and you can taste it. So it's, uh, uh, it's super interesting. It's almost uh, like a rustic version of Cabernet uh, Franc. And, and it's made into the unusual red chocolina. And people here might have had chocolina on a hot summer day or a warm spring day, but the red version is a little bit harder to find. And so I've got three, three bottles here for everyone. So now we're going to take a tour through these, through these vineyards, and we're going to go uh, up the north, and we're going to go down south. We're going to stop down south. Across from Margot is uh, Roque de Combe. And then a little bit about the geology of Roque de Combe. As we zoom into Roque de Combe, Francois uh, says his field is in an amphitheater of limestone. And you can kind of tell that there's this amphitheater of limestone. Now, how did that form? Uh, it's because there's a fault line. On the Margot side, there are gravel mounds, and we'll get into why that, why that, how that came later. Uh, but on the, le on the right side, the right bank, is the limestone shelf. Here's the eel. Now, the eel wasn't always the eel. That was the riverbed of the eel almost a half a million years ago. And then it acted as a hydraulic conveyor belt of gravel from the Massif Central, bringing all the stones from the Massif Central all over. And then what happened is underneath that, uh, the uh, east side, it left after the river changed course, the riverbed lowered with Gunzian gravel, which is on La Lande de Pomerol and Pomerol. And then later uh, versions left other gravel mounds in Pomerol. So then we fly down through uh, to uh, past Pomerol to La Lande de Pomerol, and you can now see the mounded gravel. Do you see that? This isn't a plateau of limestone. This is a big hump of gravel here, silty sandy on the west, and then the stones get a bit bigger on the on the on the east, and La, La, uh, La Fleur de Boyard is uh, in the northern part of that, uh, of the Appalachian. And this uh, zooming in is the actual uh, vineyard of, of Fleur de, uh, de Boyard. And now we're going to zoom in from the south. On the right there is the saint Amion Plateau. And then we're going to zoom into where Pomerol spills over into uh, saint Amillon. And so you can see that there's a Petrus is right there, Conseillant, right? A and then uh, these other vineyards in saint Amillon, very much, they're almost like uh, adopted children of Pomerol uh, because they share such similar terrain. And that's, the red is uh, La Dominique. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, if you don't mind, very briefly, I'm going to show you the Ile uh, because this kind of uh, hits the point home. If you see the eel here, you can see the riverbed in the middle. But then if you go to the Bergem, it's the French version of the USGS, uh, you can see the white current riverbed. And then to the right of that, those bluish green and purplish green strips are the older riverbeds that left the gravel, the rightmost strip is the Gunzian gravel uh, on the eastern part of La Lande de Pomerol in Pomerol. And then that uh, other strip that's more bluish, uh, bluish green, is the Mindel gravel that's a little siltier, sandier, and that's on another part of Pomerol in La Lande de Pomerol. And so now I'm going to turn this over to, to Matthew. So uh, I'm going to just uh, continue our, our journey through th um, the three Merlots. And uh, I had a, have a little bit of a complicated setup, so I practiced and got it all down. What I didn't um, anticipate was in all my practicing is I never had several pours of three different vintages of Fijiac before. <laughs> so th that, w that will either be a plus or a minus, and uh, we'll figure out. OK. Um, there is a tendency to characterize 
uh, Bordeaux's right bank with a single word, limestone. And you'll see that when you go online, oh, the limestone of the, uh, the right bank. And this is, an over, this is oversimplifying at best and often plain wrong. St. Emilion, as we've, we've seen, while most famous for its limestone plateau, also includes Les Graves de saint emilion and Les Sables de saint emilion And Pomerol has little, if any, limestone at all. I will focus on the uh, four uh, main viticultural soils, gravel, sand, clay, and limestone. It is helpful to think of them also as textures from fine to coarse, which correlates with water retention and nutrient exchange. All four soils are represented on the right bank, and great Merlot grows successfully on all four. As I discuss the four soils individually, keep in mind most vineyards, of course, are a combination of soils, and therefore a combination of soil attributes. There are many ways soils are described and differentiated. Plasticity, sortivity, infiltration rates, cation exchange capacity. The simplest is particle size. Clay is the finest particle, measuring less than 0 .002 millimeters in diameter. I would have put up a chart showing this, but you wouldn't even be able to see um, a grain that small. Uh, sand is coarser. A sand particle can be up to 1,000 times larger than clay. And gravel is coarsest, up to 50 times larger than sand. Smaller particle size typically means more relative surface area, more water retention, and more nutrient exchange. While geologists view soils as former rocks of igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic origin disgorged from the earth over millions of years, grapevines primarily care about two properties of soils, water retention and heat retention. Um, Excuse me here. This is not to say that factors such as slope, erosion, microbiology, nutrients don't matter. Of course they do. Um, but primary is heat retention and water retention. Water retention, or its inverse drainage, is the key to making the vines work hard for water or hydric stress. Yet, there also needs to be enough water at the right times for the vines to remain healthy. Gravel soils drain quickly, retaining little water, um, and sand also drains well. Then there is clay, which drains least well. As a rule, coarser soils have less surface area to trap water and therefore drain faster. Finally, limestone typically drains very well, though for different reasons. For this discussion, limestone will mean the hard Asteres limestone, such as in Cote de Bourg or in the San Emilion Plateau. The softer Francidae molasses, often found on the coats, can be thought of as a blend of weathered limestone and other soils, since they tend to get mixed up together. I will turn to clay and limestone in a few minutes. There are some quite interesting additional water retention properties of value to Merlot and then on to heat retention. Gravel and sandy soils tend to retain heat, which can hasten ripening. Conversely, clay and limestone are cooler soils, which may delay ripening. The four most common red Bordeaux varieties uh, ripen at different times, with Merlot earliest and Petit Bordeaux latest. Tying these concepts together, we'll make a siting quality assessment for variety and soil type, with ideal on the right edge of the plot, starting with Merlot. Merlot is less tolerant of heat and hydric stress. It can grow well in gravel, though there's a risk of overstressing. It is believed that the risk is more attributable to hydric stress as opposed to heat stress, though it can be difficult to separate the two. When it comes to Merlot, the cooler clay and limestone soils are ideal. Clay may be the most ideal of all. When Merlot grows well in other soils, there invariably is at least a dollop of clay involved in the mix. Cabernet Franc fares well across the soil types and is a significant blending grape on both banks. Cabernet Sauvignon, with its deep diving roots and late ripening, loves well-drained warm soils like gravel, such as the gravel croups of the Medoc, and as we saw earlier today, the gravel croups in, in Fijiac. Um, clay and limestone 
may not retain enough heat for a variety that at times struggles to ripen in Bordeaux's climate. In addition, limestone impedes the Cabernet Sauvignon roots from diving freely as it does in gravel. If there's great Cabernet Sauvignon uh, grown on limestone in Bordeaux, I'm unaware of it. That's why I always ask when we have winemakers saying, where do you grow your Cabernet Sauvignon? And invariably the answer is, oh, we have some gravel. Um, but this is not to say that I'm unaware of great Cabernet Sauvignon grown on limestone. The Kunawara region in Australia is famous for its Cabernet Sauvignon grown in warm terra rosa soil on a bed of hard limestone. This just shows that any framework has its exceptions, especially when there are so many different variables and so many ways they combine. Finally, I include Petit Verdot, whose plantings are on the rise all over Bordeaux in response to warming temperatures. It ripens last and requires warm soils, like Cabernet Sauvignon, and it thrives in gravel. It struggles in clay and limestone. So, let us take a closer look at the water retention of clay and limestone and its impact on Merlot. But first, a digression on the more straightforward case of, of gravel. Water quickly percolates through gravel and little is retained. Gravel soils normally need some additional way of reserving water, such as impermeable bedrock or porous clay lenses. There is such a thing as too much hydric stress. Clay has a tendency to retain water high porosity, and become saturated, low permeability, which is not at all what we want for grapevines. In fact, not all clay types are suitable for viticulture. So what makes a clay so swell for grapevines? Literally, swelling. Some clays called smectites swell dramatically as they retain water. The swelling prevents the vines from drawing water as the, and as the clay dries, it contracts, releasing water to the vines. In this way, oops, don't want to go there yet. In this way, clay acts as a regulator of water to vines. The regulation is particularly important for Merlot, which requires more consistent access to water than the other varieties. Clays differ in their swelling properties. The famous Mont Morial on Ike clay is a high swelling clay as is uh, the, the, the blue clay of Pomerol, and we heard there's a, some uh, blue clay in uh, Lalande de Pomerol, Pomerol as well. Okay. In its pure, unadulterated form, limestone is a hard rock, impermeable, and water does not flow through it at all. But when uh, when subject to the relentless chemical weathering and physical forces, limestone does not remain impermeable. It crumbles, it fractures. Sometimes hard limestone fractures vertically from deep inside the rock to the surface. Now water and roots can travel through the cracks. In vertical fractures, the drainage will be rapid. Other times, limestone will fracture horizontally. This will create a more leisurely path through the water, through the rock. From the grapevine perspective, the gravitational pull of water through limestone is not particularly promising. The water just drains away too quickly. Fortunately, uh, there is another force called capillary rise. Capillary, capillary rise um, defies gravity, making more water available to the vine roots in otherwise dry conditions. One study estimated that capillary rise accounted for 70% of the water uptake on the San Emilian Plateau in 1985. Keyes Van Leeuwen and colleagues created a model of Bordeaux harvest since 1951. Until 1980, Merlot was safely in the ideal harvest window, the red rectangle. Notice that Cabernet Sauvignon was not, and, and there were many years where it did not fully ripen. From 1981 to 2010, as the region warmed, Merlot started ripening sooner, still within the window. Cabernet Sauvignon has moved into the window, while Sauvignon Blanc is slipping outside. The authors, the authors warn if warming continues, not a foregone conclusion as we learned from David yesterday, 
But if warming continues, Merlot will ripen too early, at least in much of, of Bordeaux. Might some cooler regions of Bordeaux, Lusac, saint emilion anyone, with ideal soils for Merlot, become home for a new generation of Grand Cru, Cru Class A? In theory, where microclimates are becoming too warm, planting in cooler soils on north-facing slopes can offset rising temperatures. But this is, this is unproven. Furthermore, most classified Merlot is already optimally planted on the coolest soils. But for now, let's enjoy the almost ideal climate for Merlot over the last, ten, uh, last decade or so. I will use the five conditions for a successful vintage as described by Jane Anson. One, swift early flowering. Two, fruit set. Three, hydric stress at the right time. Four, drought and moderate heat. Five, heat and sunny during harvest. Since Decanter and the Wine Scholar Guild both use this scale, I will refer to both. So 2015, Decanter and WSG don't agree. Decanter declares the vintage on the right bank perfect, while WSG quibbles over summer heat stress in June and July and September rains, which in San Emilion were only 25 millimeters, which was less than a third as experienced um, by the northern Medoc, for example. 2016, all agree, terrific vintage. Quoting Keyes Van Leeuwen, dry vintages are always the best vintages. A caveat might be for the sandier soils of San Emilion, where there was a risk of heat stress during the long, dry July, August months. So let's discuss our three Merlots, the 2016 Roc de Calme. In 1988, Francois Micheville received a tip about a vineyard for sale just outside Bourg. The legend is that upon seeing the terroir of deep limestone seams and clay soils, he purchased it on the spot. The vineyard Micheville purchased was 55% Merlot, 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, 15% Cabernet Franc, and 5% Malbec. The Cabernet Franc has been taken out. The vines are approximately 60 years old and planted to a density of 5,500 to 7,000 vines per hectare. Less than typical for Bordeaux, though they are not alone in preferring less density for Merlot. Mitreville harvests late, often weeks after neighboring domains. The 2016 vintage was no exception. Um, harvest was around October 15th. The vinification is similar to Mitcheville's saint emilion property, Chateau Tertre de Roteboeuf. Fermentation is in concrete vats, a relatively short maceration period, and then 18 to 24 months in 50% new oak. There are about 4,000 cases of the 2016 Roc de Combe. The wine is 80% Merlot, 15% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 5% Malbec. the 2015 Le Plus de Fleur de Bouard. Uh, Monsieur de Bouard purchased the uh, Chateau La Fleur de Saint-Georges in 1998. It is located in Nayoc, which is the best gravel clay terroir in the Land de Pomerol. The uh, La Fleur, in the name of the new domain, is not only a nod to the past, but to the, quote, very early flowering that Coralie de uh, Bouard had observed. Of the 25 hectare, hectare at uh, La Fleur de Bouard, Le Plus comes from a special two hectare plot of gravel over deep clay. And as we uh, learned, not, not only is it deep clay, but it's that prized deep blue clay, the, the, the swelling type. Um, and the, the 25 hectares are planted to 80% Merlot, 15% Cabernet Franc, and 5% Cabernet Sauvignon, though as we know, uh, Le, the Le Plus parcel is 100% Merlot. And this is an example of Merlot thriving in gravel, along with a significant pr pr proportion of clay. The average age, age of the Le Plou vines is, uh, I'd had 60 years, but it sounds like it's even older, 75. Um, density is 8,500 uh, vines and increasing. And it had only been 3,500 at, uh, at the time of purchase, I guess, so they could drive the tractors uh, through it more easily, old style. Uh, the 2015 harvest began around September 17th around the Pomerol region with light rain on and off. 
fermentation is in these very unusual tanks suspended um, from the ceiling. Uh, the vats are 45 to 85 hectoliter, allowing for plot by plot fermentation. Elevage is for 33 months in 100% uh, new oak sewer leaves. Uh, the 2015 Le Plus de Fleur du Bouard is 100% Merlot in only 250 cases. We are very fortunate to have found some of this for, for our tasting. Finally, the 2015 La Dominique. Clément Fayat purchased La Dominique in 1969 when the domain was in such disrepair, revitalization efforts took five years. This was a sad state of affairs for a domain whose roots go back to the reign of Louis XIV. By the late 19th century, La Dominique's reputation peaked, and it was promoted to deuxième cru, according to the, uh, whatever the ranking system was at the time. The 20th century began a period of decline. La Dominique's inclusion as a grand cru classe in 1955 was frankly a surprise to many. In uh, 1975, when Fayat released his first vintage to the trade, many were surprised that La Dominique still existed. According to a memoir at the time, 80% of the 1975 vintage put up for sale at midday was sold for the asking price before 4 p.m. while the proprietor was still having lunch. I'm not sure which is more impressive, how quickly the wine sold out or that the proprietor was still having lunch at 4 p.m. In any event, in any event, La Dominique was back. Fayat continued to invest in La Dominique. In, in 1998, he added three hectares, and in 2009, another five hectares by purchasing Chateau Vieux Fortin to the south. In 2012, La Dominique was classified Grand Cru Classe for the entire of its 30 hectares. hectares. The vineyards are planted to 80% Merlot, 18% Cabernet Franc, and 2% Cabernet Sauvignon. In 2019, a small plot of Malbec was planted. Density is 9,000, fairly typical for Bordeaux. A 2005 soil study is helping La Dominique practice precision viticulture. Gravelly soil to the north, where it borders Pomerol, patches of blue clay along the border with Cheval Blanc, and clay soils peppered with limestone to the south. About 75% of the vineyard is very sandy soil, with some gravel, over a bed of clay. The Cabernet Sauvignon, as we might expect, is planted in the warm gravel soils nearest Pomerol. In 2015, Merlot was harbor, harvested on September 18th to 30th, and the Cabernets the first week of October. A modern cellar was inaugurated in 2016 Fermentation is in steel tanks following a cold maceration. The new vats enable fermentation on a parcel by parcel basis. Remontage and pigeage can be applied on a vat by vat basis. Elevage is in 60% new oak barrels and recently about 10% is aged in amphora and steel. La Dominique produces about 7,000 cases of it Grand Vin. The 2015 vintage is 85% Merlot 13% Cabernet Franc and 2% Cabernet Sauvignon. And let me close by saying we are fortunate to have all these wonderful wines um, for this tasting session. Thank you, Colleen, um, and uh, the National uh, Commandery for procuring them. And that is it for the formal part of our presentation. Raj, are you uh, around? Should we open it up for thoughts and, and comments? Um, if you guys can spend a little bit of time and, and think about the comparison, the contrast, uh, would love to have some comments uh, from, from each table uh, about the wines. So you have a bit of gravel in Dominique, you know, the, the, all the cab is, I think Matthew said that all, all, the, the, cab is yeah, the, all the cab is on the gravel, which is logical based on what Matthew said. And then we've got the gravel and clay, La Lande de Pomero, the Le Plus. Uh, we also have uh, Cote de Bourg, and we heard from Francois that that amphitheater had a, so close to the uh, Gironde had a regulatory effect. Both the highs and the lows were dampened. 
And so wh what does all that produce uh, as well as with the hand of the, of the vintner? And so think about that. You've got some goodies in front of you. Um, this table has the advantage of having Hubert de Bouillard. <laughs> um, and then uh, we can uh, convene in, uh, you know, five, ten minutes, something like that. Sounds good. Okay. Do the blockade. Fellow uh, commanders. The Navy then goes, the President starts saying, but do it, this, no, this, no. Uh, fellow commander and educator, the Matthew. Blockade. But then we. Rafelson. Yes. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, I, j I just wine. want to um, uh, have maybe a couple of questions. I promised uh, a little bit of time for questions, and, and I don't want to renege. So, so uh, does anyone have any questions? Sir. Answer. Um, you did a great explanation of the soils that attract Merlot, why Merlot thrives, or that Merlot thrives in cold clay soils. But my question is why? Yes. And is it, is it, is it that Merlot as a, as, a, as a vine and as a fruit needs more hydration? Or is it that it gets more microbiomes? I yeah. mean, what is, what is the rationale, that, what is the why? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Ron. So yeah, After sure, I yeah, a, a, absolutely. Yeah, so if Mer Merlot ripens a little bit too late, uh, then the flavor characteristics uh, that are produced, the, um, the anthocyanins, the polyphenols, so just the, the chemistry that, that, that occurs in the grape, produces flavors that honestly aren't very refined. And, and the only analogy that I can think of is, I don't know if any of you guys are Riesling lovers, like really love Alsatian, German, Austrian Riesling, but the difference between an Australian, a fine Australian Riesling and a Central Valley Riesling. The, the marginal climate of, uh, of uh, the northern Riesling areas in Germany and Austria uh, makes Riesling precarious, but that precariousness also produces these unbelievable flavors. It's right at the edge. So much stress, and that stress causes the vine to produce these flavors. That there is more complexity uh, with uh, the hormones. There are these hormones that work against each other. Uh, one pushes for one set of chemicals, the other one pushes for another set of chemicals, and when there's the right amount of stress, there's the right amount of flavor in the grapes. And there are sets of these in the, uh, in the grapes themselves. Back to Riesling. Central Valley Riesling, to me, tastes like uh, canned fruit. Like, it, there's nothing complicated or elegant about it. But the same residual sugar, the same volume, everything, uh, alcohol in Germany, and you know, it, it lifts the grape to you know, ethereal heights. Yeah. The same thing with Merlot. You want it to be marginal, just barely, and, and that's Merlot. And I, I think one of the people, uh, one of the presenters had talked about ripening, David Valdez. You don't want it to be past that edge for ripening unless you start doing massive, uh, massive clonal selections to push the envelope there. But that hasn't occurred. So you want it to be within that envelope of ripening. Does that answer your question? And I would say that. You're saying effectively, Raj. You're saying effectively, it needs more hydration to ripen fully. Not quite. Not quite. Do you know what? I, I, I have a few. The, the threads involved there to wrap them up are, are going to go beyond the envelope of time I have here. Okay. So, so I am uh, going to take it offline, if you don't mind, with you. And then I I will talk your ear off. But okay. I, 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 right. I think this is a great okay. This is a great topic <laughs> for a, that, a future educator yeah, exactly. is to talk we about do the dual thing. dual ripening process that's in, you know genetically inherent in, in each variety. You have the physical ripening and the phenolic ripening, and how those get aligned, and other physical attributes like um, what makes you know a, a particular variety more, more hardy. What makes them um, uh, less heat or stress tolerant. I think that's a great yeah. topic. Yeah, we for can us. do that in the future. But yeah. we're so far behind, we're not going to have time to change for dinner. 